Aloha, this is Rob Hack back with another episode of Exporting from Hawaii. Today, I'm very pleased to have uh, a, a guy who has been in the business of shipping from Hawaii for 50 something years. Probably no more of an expert exists in Hawaii than Brian Suzuki, president of Hawaii Air Cargo. Thank you for being here with us uh, today. Aloha, aloha, Rob. Aloha. So, <clears throat> companies that I consult to in Hawaii constantly hear me talk about shipping. And I think that our local companies don't pay enough attention to shipping. Packaging is a big part of that. We'll talk about that mm -hmm. too. Um, your company, Hawaii Air Cargo, is a freight forwarder. That's correct. What is a freight forwarder? Can you explain that to the audience? A freight forwarder acts, in, and I'm specifically an air freight forwarder, and uh, we ship by air. We do everything that the airlines uh, are required to do, uh, except that we don't have our own aircraft. We use all the scheduled carriers, and we have contracts with uh, each and every one of them to get preferred rates and to get space. Believe it or not, space is very tight coming into the islands. I mean, this way, going out, not that bad. We have so many tourists flying on the wide body jets that uh, space going out, we don't have too much manufacturing products. We can <clears throat> get favorable rate. And I'll explain to that about that later. Okay. Um, how old is Hawaii Air Cargo? Hawaii Air Cargo actually goes before I took over the company. And I did take over the company in 1982. And uh, so 37 years. Um, but we're about the only locally owned company. We compete against a lot of mainland and international companies. And we also com uh, compete in many respects with the FedEx, UPS, and, uh, and all the airlines. Uh, the only thing is that we consolidate uh, and a brunt of, or the, brunt, the bulk of my business is actually shipping in from the mainland. And you'd be surprised what air freighted in from the mainland to Hawaii. Air freight consists of only 2% of what's in and out of the state. But that 2% uh, can, can be just inventory products, nothing rush but as we might think, oh, air freight is expensive. We can't afford to ship air. But a lot of times it's cheaper than going by boat. And so um, it's actually something to look at. Same token when you ship to Asia. Because we have so many wide body flights, we can, and, and they're empty with cargo. So what happens is that we can negotiate prices on behalf of our customers. And uh, with that, we have, uh, say, for instance, a rate from Tokyo to Honolulu coming this way is, say, um, $2 a pound or whatever we uh, Going from here to there, that could be 50, 60 cents, uh, 60 cents a, a pound. A lot less, and people don't realize because they said, oh, in Japan, you want to sell your product. Hawaii flying it, too expensive, you know, because they know how much it costs to ship from between, you know, by air between in, within Japan, but also, you know, from say neighboring uh, Taiwan or Korea. And the uh, air freight is expensive because uh, they actually go for a certain type of product. Here, our air freight, <clears throat> since we have the space available, airlines want the business, whatever it might be, so they want to give us a, a pretty good price. So they, we do a lot of things that are uh, helpful for our exporting, although most of the exporters, the old timers know, but the new people getting into it, they just don't realize it. And when they do uh, get some kind of a, a prospective buyer without knowing the freight cost, wow, you know, air freight's going to be a lot more than we can do. Ocean freight doesn't allow less than container loads going back to the issue. So you have to fill a container, a 20-foot container, 40-foot container, mm. whatever. And that could be expensive for the buyer if you've got to load up so much stuff, you know. Uh, but there are no consolidations out of Hawaii. There are consolidations out of L.A., the West Coast. Can you, just one second, explain what is a consolidation? A consolidation is, for instance, you buy a container, a 40-foot container, and then in there you put... Ten, from ten, different ten different companies' products. You put it in there, consolidate into the container. You get a container rate. You may pay for a loading charge, 
you know, to have a company uh, stage the container and load up. But it's a lot cheaper than shipping, you know, a thousand pounds, you know, one time, uh, as opposed to shipping twenty thousand pounds one time. Mm -hmm. So those are uh, a consolidator, and they have um, a, a lot of consolidators, but unfortunately not from here to Asia. And uh, so the next best bet is we have very favorable air freight rates going back to Asia. What are the most common rates from Hawaii to Asia? I, of course, I spoke to Zarita, Haneda. Yeah. Well, we, we have a, a different um, rate structures. For instance, Narita Airport is less expensive than Haneda Airport uh, just because of the handling charges within the airport. And, and maybe your ticket prices, too, might be more expensive to us. And it's it, the convenience of being close to downtown Tokyo as opposed to Narita. But uh, Narita Airport has all the customs, cargo, cargo customs, and everything else. There's a uh, big uh, operation there with freight forwarders in Japan that uh, have offices there. So they're very convenient. Um, but at the same token, we can ship something for very inexpensively to, say, Tokyo. And then next thing you know, their customs and to, clear, uh, to have the delivery made might be more than double the price. And uh, that's where negotiations has to be, not only with the air freight side, but also on the uh, landed side. So a freight forwarder, such as Hawaii Air Cargo, are you working with customs clearance in the foreign countries? We, we do, but, um, but because we're an American company, we have to have a, uh, an agent, agent. Uh, someone that does that kind of work. And then for the volume that we may have, it's very small compared to some companies in California, wherever. But we try to ask the import of uh, record, whoever's going to be the importer, to do the shopping and maybe they order stuff from elsewhere and they already use a broker. And then with that, they can get a, a better you know, rate. How about domestic transportation in Japan? For, do you handle that as well from we, Narita to... The, we could, uh, through our Europe. agent. Yeah. Through our agent. And again, it's a one-shot deal, so therefore, you have to uh, look at, uh, you know, when I say one-shot, it may be this one time, and who knows when the next ship is going to be that you're going to deliver, you know, 500 pounds of stuff like candy something. So uh, it's good to have a, a distributor that might be well aware of all the different companies that do that kind of work. A lot of Japanese uh, stores, you can't deliver the whole order there. You get a, they're so, if you've been to Japan, you see the stores are small, they have very little uh, storage room. So the distributor has to do the storing. And then as the order is placed, you might place an order for one week supply only. And so you have to have a regular delivery setup. And, and those additional costs. So sometimes you wonder, you go and uh, you look at one store and you see this product from Hawaii and says, wow, you sell it for that much? only because of all the intermediary costs. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, that, that's kind of stuff. And then going back to shipping, handling of the cargo is very important. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, there are a lot of contractors that uh, do ramp service, cargo service, various other things. And not like, I would like to say the old days, if you went to a carrier, they, the people that uh, receive your freight they know, they're well aware, hey, you're shipping chocolate candy, so you're shipping cut flowers or, or plants, you can't leave it out in you the sun. You can't leave it in the sun. Or yeah, so therefore, they take pride in that. Some, some of the uh, newer companies, you get, we have to watch, because I pay claims on that. Mm -hmm. most, most freight forwarders in the islands, they don't pay claims because the airlines won't pay the claim. They're For saying melted that, chocolate. Melt, and yeah, they say flowers. that, oh, you, gotta, you have to uh, pack it in a refrigerated container. And that costs money to rent a refrigerated container. So we're saying that why should we have to do that? If you can take that product, which is in a container already, we put, usually we put a blanket, uh, uh, those foil blankets to repel the heat. Mm -hmm. And then we may even, during the summer, we put uh, dry ice back so that the coolness stays within the container. And uh, that's a lot cheaper that way. But the main thing is don't take it out two hours before the flight departs. Because there's no way the plane's not even in to in and hasn't even landed, and here you are taking it out, and it sits sits out in the hot cement uh, apron. So those things are something that the 
Every foreigner has to be aware of. How about, on the flip side, once those, let's use chocolate as an example, or the flowers, once they land in Japan, how do you know that they're not exposed to the hot tarmac? In it's a good Tokyo? question. Uh, i give you an example in Seoul, Korea. Well, Seoul, Korea was close to town. But when they opened the Incheon Airport, the new one, the new one it's very far it's away. It's far away. Yeah. So luckily, uh, Korean Airlines, um, they're good friends of mine too. So I said, I want to do a familiar, familiarization trip. All the chocolate candy, my customers, I want to take them to Korea and give us free tickets. Oh, no problem, you know. So we got free tickets to go over there. The, the shippers from here, wanted, they would pay for the hotel and stuff like that. But we went to the airport, and we had a cargo manager take us around. And I had about um, six companies, maybe 10 altogether from the six companies. And first things first, from the time the plane arrives, what time does it get into the cargo area? And fortunately, we were there in about maybe April, and the weather was nice. Mm -hmm. But it gets in the 100 degrees in the summer and hot, and it freezes in the winter. Right. The plane lands, they take out the cargo, they a container of chocolate candy, they leave it outside, right close to the plane, and they wait for everything to come off, and they take a train from the plane, train meaning a, a, tow, a tug, take all those containers back to the uh, cargo. It takes a 15 minute drive, let alone the wait time mm -hmm. out on the ramp. So it's either going to freeze or it's going to melt. And so that was an issue, first of all. And we got it solved. We asked the guy, how come it takes so long? Can we get it done faster? It's just, if you tell us, you know, by email or whatever, we, we send a message, actually, the home office here, the Korean Airlines office here, send a message, or JL, whoever is taking it, we'll send a message to that airport that says, we have chocolate candy. And you take it into the warehouse right away. And they will have a specific tug driver just to pull that container. And that will take just a 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot less of our time. And during the summer, they'll put a, a big blanket that will keep the heat off the top. But then the next question is what about once you get to the warehouse? Right. I found out that there are five climatic zones in the warehouse in Incheon. Five, ambient, whatever's outside, whatever is, you know, is freezing or hot. The other side is they have uh, minus 10 degrees Celsius, zero degrees. So they said, what temperature you have to list it on the airway bill and on the message. We want it air conditioned. It's about 19 degrees. Oh, we got that. So all those things got to be done to get that product in. Now, we had a situation in Japan where... A shipment went to Osaka, the big company that, you know, if you've been to Japan, coming back, see at the departure lounge, all these uh, gift uh, catalogs, and you say, oh, if you're going to Hawaii, you can order from the catalog, and then the catalog people would ship it, you know, whatever sort of date you wanted. It's a yeah. give, yeah, fulfillment type. You don't even have to buy it here. You can just go over there and, and order it. So we were shipping chocolate candy, and I said, we got back a word from one of the, my the shipper, and he said that we got a claim. I got 10 boxes of chocolate that melted. And we, sh we shipped in that load 90. How come only 10? And left me a little questioning, but we replaced it. I shipped the 10 boxes, sent it back over there. They're very happy. But a month after that happened, I was going to Osaka anyway, so I went to visit the importer. And the importer takes pride. It's got a seven-story building, all air conditioning, air conditioned. And then <clears throat> I want to see the chocolate candy that came out. So he showed me uh, the storage area. And there was a, from where the containers were, uh, the containers of chocolate or the, uh, the stock, there was an aisle of about maybe 10 feet wide. And there was a big window, picture uh, window. Sunlight. The sunlight was coming through and hitting. That's why the only 10 boxes was on the side, was hitting that constantly every day. That, and they'll pull it from the stock. So only the ones that are on that side got melted. And you get your chocolate, uh, chocolate butter uh, bloom. So that was unsaleable because it looks like mold. And uh, so I told the guy, can you move this chocolate someplace in? And I stopped everything after that. And the guy says, oh, I'm sorry. It was our fault. You know, they're so gracious. They said, we'll pay for the replacement. I said, no, it's been replaced. I'm glad I came. I'll just keep it away someplace else. 
Oh, so things like that, uh, you know, good examples of what you have to get, try to get out of your freight forwarder too, you know. Uh, a lot of times we depend on our agent but to do But it sounds like you're doing a lot of consulting work too, do you decide, just yeah. looking for rates and things. Well, I speak a little Japanese, and a lot of times we have customers come in, and we had a guy wanted to buy uh, flowers. Cut flowers. Well, let's hold that thought until after the break. Right oh, now, okay. we're going to take a break. I'm exporting from Hawaii. We'll be back in one minute. Thank you. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation. Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Aloha, this is Rob Hack, back with Exporting from Hawaii. We have Brian Suzuki, President of Hawaii Air Cargo with us. Again, thank you for being here. Before the break, we were talking a bit about Japan, but I want to jump ahead, uh, and we'll certainly talk more about Japan. I'd like to open uh, slide four, if we can, please, real quick. And let's talk about methods of shipping with air freight. Um, we talked a bit about this passenger aircraft. I think that's obvious what that is, all cargo aircraft. I think that's also obvious. Then a freight forwarder, you could, as a freight forwarder, put uh, cargo on either of these, is that correct? And even on the integrator. So what is an integrator? Can you an integrator that? is one that does not only air freights, the air ships uh, the product, but it also picks up and delivers. So integrators are your UPS uh, and FedEx. Right. And uh, they're an international, big company. We use them, believe it or not, to ship container loads. They give us a container rate. Like, for instance, I want somebody going from LA to Hilo. Uh, they have a flight to go to Kona. While well, you're talking about this, can we bring up um, slide five, please, is air containers. I think right. probably some people in the, in the audience might not understand that there are different types of uh, air containers and that it depends on the plane, the plane actually, right. and the cargo right. door and the capacity. So maybe you want to explain a bit about this. Right. Well, this slide uh, in the middle, upper one, the M1, we ship about two of those a day in from LA. That's our biggest hub coming in. and. Uh, but the other ones, we can go what we call LD containers, lower deck. It goes in the bottom of a passenger flight. The M1s go on a cargo only aircraft, and uh, that would be like the FedEx plane, the UPS plane, or Pacific Air Cargo. They have a, and also uh, Aloha Air Cargo have uh, daily flights uh, coming in from the West Coast. So using these containers, we pay a flat rate, whether we have, you know, like an LD3 container, lower deck, we can put up to 3,500 pounds. That includes the tear, the weight of the container. But we can put 3,000 pounds in it, or we can put 1,000 pounds. But we pay a flat rate. So if we have less weight, it's hard for us to get a, a really good price per pound. If we had 3,000 pounds every day, wow, our price per, per pound is less. And we sell it per pound uh, to our customers. So we have to have a mix of customers. So we have density rates, things that are very dense, heavy. We give them a preferred rate because they're heavy. Like honey on the bottom. or something Honey is like something that. else, yeah. Uh, the, unfortunately, container rates uh, are not available to Asia. So we've shipped container rates to the East Coast and from there connect to uh, a, in another carrier that won't sell container rates, but they'll sell per pound rate, and we can have it adjusted. Um, but um, those are stuff that uh, we have to look at the best price uh, also, for, for our customers, they, say they have the savings. And our industry is not regulated. It's been deregulated since uh, 1975. 
So air, it's a buyer for the air, air side, yeah. It's a buyer beware market. And uh, so when I say I'm not trying to scare you, but you could pay, you know, one, cu one customer was saying, I'm paying 50 cents a pound, you can you know, better that. And I'm thinking, no way you're getting that kind of price. So what happens, you have a slide there. That slide, um, if you can bring that up, we charge. Slide seven, please. Yes, yeah, slide seven. We charge by actual weight, or what we call dimensional weight. And you see the dimensional weight, there's a formula, mm -hmm. length times width times height in inches, uh, and then you divide by, domestic standard is 194. International standard is 166. Now, each carrier can have a different standard for what the, what the divisor is. For instance, we use 194 for domestic, FedEx and UPS use 166. 166 plus more, so your dimensional weight will increase. Well, so I have a quick question on this, that the, all of this is in inches and pounds, but internationally you're yes. not using that. So when a customer calls you uh, from Hawaii, they're probably speaking in pounds. Right. And, and then, Well, we have to clarify that. Yeah. Because some people, when they give it out to the, their customers, they have to make sure that they change to, you know, because we're the only country that uses a lot of pounds. Sure. Most other places, kilos. You know, kilograms, that kind of stuff. I mean, so it is important. That is very important. But with that customer that was getting 50 cents a pound, actually the company they're using uses a device. Instead of 194, it was 94. Mm. He was, they were paying double the weight charge. And actually for their four shipments that I audited in one month, I would have saved them $5,000 because they were charged for the space it takes up. And I said, oh, my price is better. You pay for less bulkiness. And uh, so even, even going to Asia, some boxes, we talk about packaging. I don't know if it's a good time to get into it, but packaging of your sure, product is very packaging. important uh, so that you know that if your product is bulky, you'll end up paying for the space it takes out. Companies that I consult to here, I tell them that uh, they should be, thinking about packaging very early on in the process and working with their freight forwarder, their shipping company to uh, decide what kind of packaging is best to ship. Can we bring up slide nine, please? Um, I think that this is a, a good one we can talk about for a second, hidden charges, because you were just talking about this. So what are some of the things that companies need to look out for? Well, number one, documentation. Some companies charge just to cut a their bill. We don't charge for that, but you could, some people... Can, sorry, let's be basic. What is an air bill? An air bill, a bill of lading, air bill is what that particular shipment lies on. It's a house air bill, it's a free quarters house bill. You have an airline air bill, and, uh, and on and on. So, so, so who, who would uh, do this paperwork? Would you do it as a the, as the freight forwarder, or is, we the, do is it, the shipper the filling shipper all this can, out? The shipper can do it. We will give them an air bill number, and they can go in and make it that this is the air bill number, and use that for their tracking and tracing. Uh, and all the FedEx, UPS, they have their old bill of lading, but it's all electronic. And then for that, all you care about is the tracking number when it gets uh, received, when it gets sent out, you know, so you can make sure it gets to where it's supposed to be on time. So when you look at all of those things, uh, shippers export deck. Uh, the shipper is supposed to be doing that, but then they can do it, but they don't want to deal with it, so they let, ask us to do it, and which we do. But you have to have a value of $2,500 or more in that particular shipment to, for U.S. Customs. Everything that goes out of the U.S., they want to know what's going out. So they make it so that it's $2,500 or more. Uh, on the other hand, we have a lot of, and it has to be one SQ, SQ item one particular type of item. You can have a mix of stuff that each one amounts to, you know, $1,000 and not $2,500. Um, then you don't have to make an SED. Mm -hmm. But all those things are stuff that documentation charge. Um, of course, you're going to look at pickup, delivery, transfers. Some people charge just to take it from their facility to the airport. And uh, another thing, too, as a freight forwarder, we have to uh, abide by all of the rules that the airlines do. So we are under the gun with TSA. All our employees have to have background checks done, and they have to know all the rules. 
They can't make stops between our facility and, say, United's uh, cargo office. We can't stop and pick up a drink or something somewhere. It has to be watched, monitored, or locked, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then we do have TSA, believe it or not, would send someone in, and because we know most of the inspectors here, they end up uh, sending, they bring in somebody from the West Coast, they come in for a few weeks, and then they go and try to walk into a cust uh, our facility, or they want to order something. They'll call from the hotel, can you pick a pickup? I belong to uh, I'm with, uh, IBM. We can't just take their word for so it. So they're just testing you. They're testing us because we have to call the home office. Where's your, where do you work out of? You know, we can't use you, even though it's a big name, and obviously they would probably be a, a known shipper. We have to watch that. But so we, we do all that kind of stuff for which you even get a, what do you say, cheaper rate than going to the airlines. Uh, so it's something that we, uh, you have to be, be looking out for. Uh, and again, one of the things with uh, Japan or anything else, we, you know, once your product hits, they want all you have. And a lot of the uh, producers here are not big time. They can right. manufacture big stuff. Uh, I'll give an example. One customer of mine, they've been my customer from day one. And I'll say, it's a whole host. But, you know, you go all around Singapore, you go to Korea, whatever. The biggest seller of macadamia nut chocolate it's host, but it doesn't say Hawaiian host, Singapore host. Yeah. It's all the same. We ship the stuff. Singapore host, Korea host, all mm -hmm. that. Very smart, and that's where packaging comes up. You look at the thing and you go, wow, that is terrific. And uh, some of the, um, anyway, like in so uh, Seoul, the Incheon Airport, they have to pay for cashier there. They have a duty-free store, right? but each chocolate that's sold at that place shares in the cost of that uh, of course. Uh, salesperson. So before we finish, can we bring up uh, slide 10? Mm -hmm. This is how people can contact Brian and Hawaii Air Cargo. You say, you've been there for 37 years. That's great. Um, there's nobody in Hawaii, in my opinion, that would know more about shipping by air internationally or even to the mainland than Brian Suzuki. So please contact him. Uh, or his company, if you have any shipment requirements. Is there anything you'd like to add before we No, wrap I up? think uh, what you're doing, Rob, is great. I think more people should be watching your program oh, thank you. all the time <laughs> because you share a lot of information that we try to share, but then we're limited as to about, you know, time we can spend. But I can go on and on and on. And I've, I've um, thought, no, uh, I, I didn't make any money, but it was at the community colleges, I lectured at the University of Hawaii and all the uh, university on the neighbor islands too. But um, people just, the students as far as that concerned, are only looking at their own personal stuff. So what catches their attention is we have a lot of international students and say, when you graduate, are you gonna send your uh, computer home, your books and stuff? Never thought about that. Then I said, you gotta shop around. Same talking with products from Hawaii. You have to shop around, look at what's going on. and. I'm not saying that everybody in our staff can say everything that I know, but at least if they can, they'll ask me to talk to that person and, and try to see if we can get the, uh, the customer to want to export. Because that's what we, we need more export. I agree completely. Yeah. That's why we have this show exporting from Hawaii. So yes. thank you again so much uh, to ThinkTech and to Brian Suzuki for being here today. We'll see you again in two weeks, same time. Thank you. Thank Mahalo. you very much. Thank you.